Joining me now is Senior Advisor of the Atlantic Council and Business Executive for National Security, Harlan Ullman. Harlan, thanks for being here. Always good to be with you, Liz. All right, Harlan, tell us about this conference. Uh, you attended, in what capacity did you attend? Uh, the Americans and the Russians officially are not really talking to each other. So at a time when you need dialogue, uh, it's not really happening. I was there in my own capacity as a private citizen, and I had a chance to meet with a large number of very senior Russian civilian and military officials. And the problem can be put like this. Um, in 1961, Jack Kennedy sent two of his senior advisors to Vietnam, and when they came back and reported to him, Kennedy said, are you guys sure you went to the same country? And when you hear the Russian version of events and the American version of events, the question you raise is, are you talking about the same situation? There's such a gap in perceptions that the only way that we can diffuse this situation is to have a far more extensive dialogue. And quite frankly, since both sides are not really talking to each other, except Secretary of State to Foreign Minister, we need to start with a military-to-military -military dialogue, first to avoid untoward incidents at sea or in the air. You'll note that Russian aircraft were buzzing American destroyers in the Baltic and the Black Sea and trailing NATO aircraft. Something could go wrong. We have an incident. A plane gets knocked down. And who knows how that could escalate. So what I take away is that both sides have got common interest in terms of trying to prevent terrorism, dealing with the problems in Syria, which are going to get worse. But their views of the world are so different that the only way that we can discuss without getting into an arms race is through a more open discussion. And I only hope that that will take place. And I've been lobbying very hard, both in Moscow and Washington, for that to happen. All right, putting the differing perceptions aside for a second, just looking at reality, uh, first of all, what do you mean by military to military dialogue? Do you mean engaging them or uh, kind of working in tandem together to combat terrorism? Well, a combination, we have to discuss what exactly the Russians want. But for example, I think it would be very important for our chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Joe Dunford, to meet their Chief of Defense Staff, General uh, Jeremasov. Uh, and I think to talk about how we can work together in Syria to prevent terrorism, how we can defuse the situation, uh, how we can reconcile the stationing of American missiles in Europe. The Russians are going to declare that that's a violation of the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. And to some degree, technically, they may have a point. But what happens is that all these incidents without talking can grow out of control. And there may not be any way of being able to uh, retrieve the situation. So I would like to start with the chief of defense staff talking to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. I'd like to see legislator to legislature, Russian Senate to American Senate, begin discussions. How do we diffuse these issues? How do we work together on common interest? And how do we resolve the sticking points that separate us? And make no mistake, there's huge separation. All right, now you also speak, you write about uh, Russia's paranoia about the U.S., about NATO, uh, closing them out. Is there any truth, Harlan, uh, to this paranoia, to their perception, if you will? Absolutely. And unfortunately, it's very difficult for Americans to believe this. But you've got to realize that Russia is now down to a population of under 150 million people. It has all sorts of economic problems. NATO has 28, soon to be 29 numbers. Uh, the Russians probably give far more credit to our military capability than we do. But Russians for thousands of years have been paranoid. And I'm not suggesting that that's necessarily a healthy condition. But we have to understand that. And when they claim that the West is really building an arms race and we don't see an arms race, we have to understand where they're arguing from so that we can perhaps have a negotiation to try to limit the amount of money we're going to spend on arms. And where we're uncomfortable or they're uncomfortable, try to take some kind of negotiation. We did that with the incidents at sea agreement in 1972. We've done that with a no number of START, SALT, and other kind of nuclear negotiations. And I think more than ever, what we need now is some kind of a discussion path to negotiations where we can cut back on our military maneuvers. Uh, we're increasing slightly what we're doing to NATO, sending over a brigade uh, that's only a couple of thousand people. The Russians view that as something that's just an enormous shift in the balance of power, which it's not. So how do we reconcile these different perceptions? It's in our mutual interest now that terrorism, and certainly what's happening in the Middle East, is the most important danger facing us. And the more we have a standoff, the more it's going to be very, very difficult to be able to take on the larger danger to east and west, which, as I said, stems from the Middle East and North Africa. 
Right, so from what you're saying then, it sounds to me like uh, Russia's perception of the U.S., whether it's in regards to military strength, military capacity, or military intention, seems to be slightly off, really, slightly inaccurate. There were 90 countries in attendance at this security conference, Harlan. Uh, was Russia trying to push their perception of the United States uh, onto these 90 countries to maybe enhance ties with them in the face of what they consider to be a U.S. NATO threat to them? Well, from the Russian perspective, uh, they would take great issue, and I'm not speaking <laughs> somebody who's supporting the Russians. I'm just saying that the Russian perception is what it is. We can agree or disagree, but that's a fact. That's a reality. What the Russians were trying to do was to use that conference as a way of increasing its ties with many countries in Latin America, many countries in Africa and around the world. It is going to use the Shanghai Cooperative Organization, which is really an economic group with China and five other countries in it, and the Collective Security Treaty Organization, which is really the former Soviet uh, republics working together, as a way of trying to outflank and break through what they believe to be encirclement by the West. Now, we can poo-poo that and say they have no reason to think so, but they do. And this conference was one way that the Russians are trying to increase their influence, as well as using it as a means to sell uh, military equipment and military uh, systems to the rest of the world. And in terms of the ability to uh, enhance its image, I think the Russians did a very good job. In terms of substance, uh, the substance of the conference, I think, was less important than the attempt to influence and get greater access and respectability on the part of the Russians. And that is what is very, very interesting to me. Right, and we've said this before, that perception is reality to certain people. And we've talked specifically uh, in regards to radical Islamists, that their interpretation of their religion is reality to them, even if we consider their perception to be uh, incorrect. And I guess it's the same situation with the Russians. They view what they view uh, the United States to be the threat to them uh, is their reality, even if they're perceiving it incorrectly. Very interesting, Harlan. Uh, thank you for sharing your perspective and your experience at the conference. We'll talk to you soon. Coming up, Secretary of State John Kerry tells college graduates to prepare to live in a borderless world. That and President Obama's plan to transform America to fit into that. Next with Curtis Ellis.